My name is Adam Bean and welcome to the mid-year edition of Airhex TV with uh, lots of questions, um, at least some interesting questions. So let's start with the show. So before we start, some news. First, um, I performed a podcast interview or conversation with Jason Green of uh, Whitefly and uh, Red Hat and we had a chat about application servers, caching, distributed caching and clustering, so it might be interesting. Um, what also happened is the following. So um, I got another uh, room for the um, airhacks.com workshop and it's going to be at December the 10th. And at December the 10th, um, there is going to be um, a Micropof profile in Jakarta E workshop. So what I plan to do is to show some um, micro profile features like metrics and configuration and whatever micro profile will be able to do in uh, in December because I'm using a micro profile in production already on top of Java E8 application service. So this is uh, another day in December. And what I also did, I recorded um, two screencasts, uh, free screencasts on the microservice channel uh, about micro profile metrics and exposing micro profile metrics to Prometheus. So I published it today and I will uh, blog about that uh, next week. Okay, so these were the announcements and let's start with the topics. So the first question is from SCRM Tray 91. So um, hello again. He asks, we are using Git as a versioning control, JFrog, RT Factory or Nexus, TeamCity, Yotrek, and we decided to change our flow a little bit. So we got a few questions. By the way, I will read the questions fully. Why? Because I plan to uh, publish this show as, uh, as audio only as well. So how you recommend to do versioning for internal build like RC, uh, um, release candidate, snapshot for testing, test server or internal developer server, production build from master branch to go customers for deploy and production server. Also some project, also some project also contains clients for web service access, which will we include in other projects. So um, I did it recently for a couple of companies. So what I used was um, Jenkins, um, pipeline as code, so the Jenkins file. And um, how it how it worked was I um, we implemented a hook for uh, Git, GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, depend uh, or GitLab depends uh, uh, really depends on uh, on the environment. And on each commit the project was built. Now uh, what we also did there was one if else uh, switch. So uh, there was distinction between a just developer build and release build. So what happened on developer build? So the build was just uh, all the tests were performed and which tests, unit tests, integration tests, system tests. If you're interested uh, interested in this, uh, check out, I think the URI is Java EE testing.com. So there's a whole workshop about that. And this workshop uh, comprises the tests but um, not the automation part. It's just how to write tests, integration tests, and system tests, stuff like that. So how, how many episodes? There are 48 episodes. Um, also performance tests. And um, this is exactly what you do in the projects. And um, so in case there is a release build uh, in the Jenkins, uh, Jenkins file, there is, I think it's called read maven pom um, this method. And it reads the pom and I extract the version and use the version to um, to tag to create a tag in in Git, and also tag the doc image. So the um, the, the whole thing, the so microservice is packaged and pushed to Docker. And um, so the only difference between internal build and release build is whether there is a tag or not. The pipeline is exactly the same. So what is your practice in projects? Uh, so we. Automate, I, I automate whatever I can uh, with Jenkins, um, what we did even. So the projects, um, it is even possible to have, if you if you are in Java E environment, we even have one Jenkins file for all projects. So with a convention of a configuration, you can absolutely do this. Why? Because if you know that the name of the microservice is, let's say, uh, workshops, then you also know that the system tests is 
uh, workshops dash st. So um, if you know the convention, uh, you can create, uh, you can uh, you can configure or you can create the pipeline, a generic pipeline for multiple projects. Um, how do I make organized tags on Git for release, snapshot, and so forth? So um, so on each commit, the thing is built, and uh, on build there is no there are no major releases or no tags. So there's just a snapshot dependencies. And if there is a release build, there is no snapshot. And um, in the past, I used Maven release plugin for um, for uh, microservices in Java 8. This is actually not needed because the only thing what happens is you have to increase the version in the POM. And what you don't have to do is, for instance, you don't have to upload the war to uh, to Artifactory or Nexus because uh, we already have the, the binary image in in uh, in Docker. Do you use different uh, the uh, question number four? Do you use different branches for production and testing? Uh, yes, locally probably, but usually I only have. I actually. So uh, what I do is I just, uh, it really depends on the project. In some project, we only have master branch, for instance. So that's the only thing we have. And uh, whether we have branches or not, it really depends on the release strategy. If the release strategy is like, you know, evergreen browsers, where uh, we just push it to production, there is no branching. But if we have, you know, formal releases, which are usually caused by or caused defined by the marketing department, then you need you know uh, branches to hold back the features. Otherwise, um, you will see all the features up front, which is probably not not wished. But uh, the, uh, the the trend is going uh, exactly towards I would say uh, towards um, it's called continuous releasing without holding back features. Can you describe your workflow with your projects, making test build, making release build, build, git tagging, versioning? Oh, now I know what you mean by test build and release build. So we have several stages usually. So uh, in my recent project, we used OpenShift. It's like a private cloud. And we had one OpenShift namespace, or it could be Kubernetes namespace, which was the test stage or development stage. And uh, if you build something successfully, you saw that in the test stage. Now, re release build would mean um, it is available in the Docker registry of the test environment, and uh, we, you can promote it to the next environment, but this is like user action. So sometimes it happens automatically, and sometimes, sometimes it, it just is caused by a, you know, with a button, uh, human interaction. So if someone says, okay, I would like to have this build uh, to be promoted, it just pulls from the Docker registry from the from the test environment and promotes that to the integration environment. And the same is true for production as well. The next thing is, do you use auto, the next question number six is, do you use auto deploy features when production build is ready to release? On Docker, yes, because it really does not matter. So we have one application server per war, and this auto deploy is usually easier. And uh, why it doesn't matter? Because we run the system tests as well. So uh, it just runs, it is deploys once and never again. I would still prefer CLI, but if you go to my Docklands projects in GitHub, um, Docklands, let's say Docklands and I'm being on GitHub and search for instance for what's the recent server Pyara 5 docker file you will see that what i'm actually doing is somewhere where is it um install there the domain and somewhere there should be deploy there deployment there is install there and deploy and um what happens then in your microservice i will just copy um, the war to here and then it's going to be deployed on Payara. CLI would be nicer because I would get uh, immediate feedback but with this approach I can deploy on Payara, Whitefly, Tommy, whatever because all the application server says deploy there. If I would use the CLI, unfortunately deployment API is not standardized in Java. So there was one API back then but it's deprecated or is no more available. And uh, since then I'm just uh, uh, I, I would have to provide command line interface uh, for all application servers.
So um, if you have the choice, use CLI. Jabo CLI is admin in Payara, and uh, and uh, this this auto deploy works well in production in several projects. Particular startups are using this. If we have, uh, for instance, in one project we use um, OpenShift Builder, and it comes with CLI. Okay, now. Is it possible to somehow automate the process? Absolutely. So in my projects, whatever I said right now is um, absolutely automated. So uh, what you what you will have to do is to push your changes. Then you will kick in the how it's called test build. Would you, yeah. Then the test build would be started. If you would like to promote the build, uh, you will have to go to Jenkins and say um, there is a parameterized build, and you will have to check a. Uh, a box and say this is a release build and what will happen then it will tag everything after successful tests and um, push the image to a registry and it'll be ready for promotion and another Jenkins pipeline will pull the image create the environment in in in, in integration stage and just run it actually we do it on the airhex.com workshop at um, Munich airport if you're interested in it okay and uh, the uh, versioning scheme I use Semver this is what I prefer, semver, semantic versioning. This is the scheme. Why? Because if there is a standard, just take it. Nice. Thank you. Veneto, ask me. Hello, Adam. I really like Prime Faces and how I and now I am starting to use Spring Boot, and I would really regret losing Prime Faces in favor of Spring MVC. I have tried a little join faces, they nicely sorts out all the dependencies for you, and it seems to work fine. What are your thoughts on join faces? What would you recommend me to do? Throw away Prime Faces and use Spring MVC and avoid mixing the two worlds. Thank you so much. So first I have to admit, I have almost no Spring Boot experience. So my experience was last year, there was a task force. So I helped them to make S Spring Boot work again. And this was actually a funny story. Um, they asked me uh, for Java E support because they thought that Spring Boot is Java E or a, an application server, which it kind is. And I came and I saw Spring Boot. And, um, and uh, because I didn't have the Spring Boot environment on my machine, I used Whitefly or Payara, I don't even remember. And they asked me why it's so quick, the deployment. I say, yeah, because uh, this is a kind of Spring Boot, but it isn't. It's called Java. -y. <laughs> but um, both, uh, both environments were very similar. So uh, I, I was able to help them. And right now, I also help a project with Spring Boot, but uh, without you know having too, too much experience with Spring Boot. But um, what you have to know is, following the prime faces is based on faces servlet and spring boot there are multiple profiles but if you have jetty or tomcat it is per perfectly perfectly fine to run prime faces on it and i have no experience no production experience with john faces but i'm really happy with prime faces so um i have to admit no idea whether john faces is fine or not and i never mixed prime faces with spring mvc and I don't think you have to give up prime faces if you if you if you if you are using Spring Boot. But uh, I have to admit I have no real project experience with Spring Boot. I get lots of project requests, but everyone asks me about Java E. So um, <laughs> strange world. Okay. Now, Golok asked me, "Hello, I can I can't find how to upload a file." from a multi-form part using only JAXRS on standard Java 7 API. Now, there are extensions from Jersey, REST, Easy, ATC, but there are not portable between implementation servers. This is true. Multi-part form is not part of JAXRS, so you will have to use the extensions. But, accidentally, what I did uh, actually last week uh, to a client, I wrote a, uh, like a, uh, file upload uh, microservice for legacy integration of, of an app. It's actually a microservice and is based on Java 8 actually. And uh, what you perfectly can do, you see this put this meter that comes from micro profile. It's actually um, code uh, we released. And uh, there is um, a method write file. This is files is the resource and put this is the file name and I just accept input stream. So another microservice just 
streams the file to this microservice. This is, of course, not multi-part, but this is what I usually use for file upload. Um, this multi-part thing is fi file upload from a from a parser, uh, from a parser, from a browser. So if you click, you know, the file upload button. So this is different. Okay. So this is this what I uh, what I did last week uh, with Matrix and uh, MicroProfile uh, Metered, which might be interesting to you, and some configuration for Docker. Yes. So you are right. This multi-part is not standardized but you don't have to use multi-part. And if you have, you, you have to use the extensions. And there was uh, even in the past, we used Jakarta Commons file upload. Uh, but uh, I would say, if you if you know you are just, uh, the, the whole project will run on, for the project lifetime, you will use a single server. I would rather use, you know, um, uh, REST easy or JAX REST extensions. So, P2MAL. Ask me, hello Adam, what are your thoughts on MVC 1.0? So my thoughts are really nice. So I really like uh, this uh, technology, Model View Controller 1.0. Um, any alternatives for it or should I just use servlets with GSPs? Actually, in one of my uh, projects, we just use GSPs are to pre-render uh, web components so um, and, and servlets with JSP so you have already MVC with JSPs and I would say 10 years ago I delivered some courses uh, now as well but 10 years ago uh, uh, courses about presentation layer um, and what I did I recreated struts from scratch to show how it works and this is fairly easy to do this so we had servlet which forwarded uh, um, this I think it's called request dispatcher and forwarded the stuff to JSPs. So if you are able uh, with a few lines of code to create a, a servlet with JSPs, which serves your need, I will go with that. It's just nothing will be dead, you know. Uh, it will it uh, it will be portable and uh, simple and could be maintained by you. But you shouldn't write, you know, recreate MVC from scratch. So keep if the code is simple, a few lines of code in a servlet, then uh, go with your own invention. So and and then. Then uh, P2, P2MAL proceeds. I'm seeking a clean JAX REST API that returns templates with pre populated model vanilla JS. Exactly what I did. And I used vanilla JSPs because there are already uh, iterations and stuff like that. We'll do the rest maybe with web components. Perfect. Perfect choice, web components. MVC 1.0 seems to provide all that, but its, it's future is unclear. Yeah. Future is unclear. This is true, but uh, I don't think it will die. So, um, would use in a project with expected lifetime over five years. I don't think MVC 1.0 will die in five years. So, uh, what you could do, you could check out the code and take a look how complex it is and then decide. And hence, you are already asking um, that question, which uh, is uh, well thought through an uh, intelligent question, actually, then it's probably, you know what you are doing, then I would just try to approve of concept half a day, create a servlet with JSPs and see how complex it is. And if it is clean and understandable, ask your colleagues, you know, you are getting this, what I did. If they say yes, simple code, then go with your own invention. Yeah. GSF or G SPA's architecture is not, not an option. Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Seven asked me, Hello, I'm a fan of Prime Basis 2. It allowed to build nice looking and modern web apps without J JS, so JavaScript scripts. I use Prime Faces on white line and every time pack Prime Faces jar into a WAR file. Yes, this is what I. Uh, yeah. So you are perfectly trendy. Why? Because you created your own Uber jar or Fed jar. So you should be proud of it. I'm, of course, kidding. Um, it abuse. It abuse that is not good idea. So. Uh, I think I. What he means is, I I I think it's not a good idea. So I could you explain how to use prime faces on Whitefly as module? Probably it require more configuration. So I never tried it, but it should actually work. So the idea is to to drop in prime faces as a dependency to Whitefly as a module, and then you don't have to redeploy it, um, every time with war. So what you could try first is take a look on Whitefly Swarm. And so-called hollow, 
hollow jars. So what is it? So you could create your own whitefly swarm uh, um, distribution with prime faces, but keep your war separate. So you have one jar whitefly with prime faces, it's called hollow jar, and then the next jar or war is your war. So I would just take a look at that. So I have no time right now to try it, but it should work. What we also did in the past, we create whitefly modules for legacy security login module, something like this, and it worked well. And I think prime faces might also work because at the end of the day, it's just uh, a servlet extension. So it actually should work. Um, and I will try it in your case because uh, your war is going to be thinner and deployment faster. Okay, now next question. I Aliatir asked me or writes, Hi Adam, I started learning Java and I have a question regarding JAXRS and EJB. I saw a lot of examples that annotate the resource with stateless or singleton or sometimes request scoped or application scoped. So I also saw everything. And I wanted to know if you can help me to understand in which cases the one is preferred over the other. So what you what you uh, can do, you could use, for instance, stateless or uh, or singleton. So what's the difference between stateless and singleton? So uh, stateless is like a singleton, but is pulled. And pulled means if you have five transactions going on, five parallel transactions, you get five instances of EJBs, and uh, this will usually result in slightly better scalability than the singleton. Uh, why? Because the, um, the, the, the invocation is going to be a little bit more parallel. So in, in regular projects, it really does not matter. So this is a singleton, and um, at singleton, you have to, to, to make a difference. Is it in javax.inject singleton or javax.ejb singleton? So the inject singleton uh, behaves like application scoped and Java X at EJB singleton, it just locks the instance. So the EJB singleton will, will, is only able to process one thread at a time. This Java X dot inject singleton and application scoped are similar. They, they can pro process multiple threads at the same time in the same instance. So you have to be careful what we are doing now. What's uh, left over is request scoped. And what you can do with JAXRS is you can inject uh, with context, for instance, params, headers, and stuff like that. So if you inject them as attributes or fields, what can happen with singleton is that they are not switched per request. So what you, what you could do in this particular case is to use request scoped so that all the fields are going to be re-injected. Um, this is, of course, slower, but this is how it works. So um, what I usually do, I prefer stateless over the others because usually you get more monitoring information from application servers and stateless also starts transaction earlier. But um, if you know what you are doing, application scope is also fine. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, this is what I'm doing. So um, do I need to make everything inside the resource thread safe with singleton? Depends which singleton. So if you are using, uh, again, JavaX dot inject singleton, uh, yes, with EGB, no, but uh, with uh, EGB singleton is a bottleneck. Only, only one thread at a time is able to access your singleton. So if you have a resource, usually the resource has no state. So there is, you should, I mean, nothing can happen with, uh, with concurrency. Okay. On another topic, I purchased most of your Java courses. So thank you for purchasing and they are great. Please make more. Um, yeah, uh, I'm thinking about that. So what I will do next is uh, provide some, some web courses as well because I get lots of requests about that. And do you have any video tutorial on real world CI using Jenkins, Maven or Git? Uh, the testing is the closest, but um, I think I should record something with CI and Jenkins, so it could work as well, a short tutorial. But right now I'm working on another uh, SPA tutorial and uh, web tutorial. Okay, thank you for buying and thank you for watching my stuff. So, Musali says, Hi Adam, are you logging and monitoring questions for Java 7 or 8? Greenfield project consisting of several related apps. Now, question number one, planning to have centralized logging 
and to log events using a structured format JSON. Each Java utils logging sufficient for this would need to at least create a JSON formatter, or would it be better to use logging framework like Log4j or other, Log4j2 or other? So um, the funny story is uh, uh, in one of my projects we use OpenShift and we use system out print line, so not even Log4j to uh, to write the logs because it's aggregated behind the scenes. So what you could do, of course, with Java 8 or 7, you can inject your own interface called Logger and uh, behind the interface you can implement whatever you like. It's just like, you know, a two-liner. And um, uh, using a JSON formatter, yeah, you could write with JSONP or create a JSON formatter for Java UT logging as well. But um, just try system out print line first. And um, if you are in cloud native environment, if not um, Java UT logging, this is what I will start with because there is no external dependency needed. And log4j2 is also an interesting alternative. So what I also did in, uh, in, uh, in projects, this is um, what you are mentioning in the question number two, I also log directly to Elasticsearch. For instance, instead of writing file to a Docker container first, then, then read the file again and write it to a central location, I just send it to a cent central location, uh, not the file rather than the event. Uh, you could also use database, uh, just write directly to database. The question is always, um, what is log, how, how logs are defined in your projects? Are logs like uh, audits or just, you know, additional uh, diagnostic data? If it's just optional diagnostic data, it doesn't have to be transactional. I would just write to a central location in the simplest possible format. You could uh, evaluate uh, WebSockets. I used REST, for instance. We even implemented at the and the, and the last, last in um, 2017, the last uh, airhacks.com workshop, uh, uh, a direct, not a panda, we just wrote a Jax REST client, which directly locked everything to Elasticsearch. Now, next question, next question number two. It looks like separate tool stacks are often used for logging and monitoring. For uh, for example, Elasticsearch in Kibana for log data and Prometheus Grafana for metrics data. Is this the best practice? Um, I think it is. And the, and, and the reason why it is, is uh, Prometheus and Grafana, so pro what Prometheus is time series data. So what Prometheus is about is to compute statistics. So what, uh, um, pro <coughs> what Prometheus does is it, um, it gathers, um, let's say, uh, numbers, and uh, and is able to co to do something with the numbers. And if the number repeats several times, it just skips and it knows behind the scenes. Okay, I saw now f five times five, so I just uh, able to compress that. So Prometheus is very efficient with the compression, and this is time series database. And Grafana uses Prometheus as a data source, um, and uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana. It's a slightly different. So Elasticsearch is a database, a full full text search database, and it works like um, if you are writing logs to Elasticsearch, you would usually tag the logs with different uh, tags, metadata, and then you can search for this tags. And Kibana is better to visualize that. So Kibana is more or less like better to visualize, let's say, text data and tags, and Grafana uses Prometheus uh, as a data source and uh, and is able to uh, to create really nice charts and diagrams. Um, so, or is there a good solution that supports storage and visualization for both logs and metrics data? I don't think so because again, in Prometheus, I would rather gather business metrics, you know, how often a, a video course was bought, how many fraud attempts there were, and uh, what are the most popular courses and Elasticsearch and Kibana I would e use uh, for uh, searching for s stack traces, problems and complete different use case, I would say. And by the way, I consistently confuse Kibana and Grafana. So you'd be really cautious if I mention Grafana or Kibana because I confuse both. And uh, we did also in the last December workshop at ehex.com. So we played a little bit with Grafana and Kibana. Okay, I was thinking about having apps automatically emit metrics data to some destination. This is actually what happens here, this metered here, and um, it exposes metrics just to, to write the file. 
please take a look at the screencast from the free, two free screencasts I published today to the microservices, let it, Java EE microservices. So this is a paid workshop, but there is a bonus mater material, bonus features, they are completely free. Expo exposing business metrics and fetching metrics with Prometheus. So uh, these two free screencasts. And what I did in the screencasts, I did exactly what you are asking for. Um, uh, they, I'm emitting business metrics and gathering the metrics with Prometheus. So I was thinking about having apps automatically emit metrics data to some destination, beginning on startup and continuing entire time apps app is running. Do you see downside to this approach? No, this is what you should do and I always do. If this is done, would you recommend that app metrics also be made available through REST endpoints? Absolutely, because uh, this, is, this is the easiest way, you know, to, 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 to get the data. And with micro profile, you get them as a um, Prometheus format or JSON. So you can just say, I'm accept colon application JSON. Okay, now, next question. Mr. Rinkevich asked me, have you tried WebAssembly? Could it be the future? What is WebAssembly? So WebAssembly is like a bytecode for the browser and, um, and all the programming languages are, are, are supposed to be compiled into WebAssembly. And the JavaScript um, virtual machine in a browser will interpret the WebAssembly. And could it be the future? It could be, but it's very limited right now. So there is no concurrency, no DOM access and stuff like that. So, but right now uh, I thought about, about integration of legacy resources. For instance, if you have some code written in C, encoders, compressors, whatever, it is fairly easy to convert that, the algorithms to WebAssembly. So right now it is more or less an integration, integration feature. And in long term, it could become the future the problem or the problem um, what happens right now is the javascript es6 becomes or es7 becomes more and more like java so it is actually a nice language uh, meanwhile so all this strange stuff is still available but you don't have to use it so um, actually there is no reason to get rid of uh, the modern javascript to introduce another language so but uh, what could happen that we get cross compilers there is already one c sharp to WebAssembly, i think C sharp, C sharp web assembly. And I think there, there is one cross compiler between um, C sharp and web assembly. So you could use that. In my eyes, I would rather use uh, vanilla JavaScript. So uh, this web assembly makes web a more viable platform because you have one more option to integrate, you know, your native code uh, with uh, with web. And I don't think it will completely replace ES, ES6, uh, let's say in the next five years. So it's my opinion. So I will just refresh and see. So no questions. And what's here? There is no sound, but the sound is actually should be available. Okay, so I think we are done. I would say thank you a lot for watching and for all the questions. And um, see you next month. And see you, of course, at Airhex, airhex.io. If you like, listen to the podcast. I will probably um, um, publish this um, Airhex TV show also as Airhex FM. And even at conferences. So thank you for watching and bye.